and we are live. Welcome to Cocktails and Calamity, the show where we get a little bit lit and discuss the technology, politics, and social transformations shaping humanity's global future. I'm thrilled today. We've got an old friend, an amazing friend. Katie Rooney is with us today. Uh, she's the director of transportation policy. She is a director of transportation policy, has written about community connections, integrating transit and streets, new advances in freight, trip demand analysis, emerging regional practices, and next generation planning scenarios. Katie, how the hell are you? I'm good. That sounds so much more impressive than I normally. You know, <laughs> That's my job. My job is to make you sound impressive, which you are. And, and it's certainly something that uh, this is a topic I'm really excited to talk to you about because yeah. you have so much experience um, in uh, in public transit and city planning. And so I really wanted to pick your brain today um, because there's some crazy shit going down in the world. And we got a we got a big future ahead of us. And we need to know what that where the hell we're going. Yeah. Yeah, that's the best part. We have so many choices. Yeah. Right. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I wanted to just kind of get your background. If you could share with us just kind of like what got you into this field and what, what you're passionate about, what, what drives you uh, in this in this field. So I'm super weird. I figured out what I wanted to do at 13. And I've, except for like, one year where I took career tests, my freshman year, my sophomore year of college, I've basically been doing that the entire time, which is government work, like public policy work. So but that's a pretty broad field. And so how does that how do you end up being like a transportation city planner, policy person and, and now like advocate, I guess um, you. I don't know. I really got into environmental stuff in New Mexico, which where water can, was and continues to be a big issue. Um, that kind of got me started. And then I went to school in New Orleans, Louisiana, where the environmental field really takes on a very different feel, um, flavor to it. Like for those of you that have ever seen the Pelican brief, um, you right. know, it's really more about people and communities and, and, and that sort of experience so that really expanded it. And then basically I continued in that area in environmental policy for my master's worked on some sustainability programs for the federal government, and then gradually got into transportation. And really what it is, is that when you talk to people in the environmental field, there are tons of amazing things, and frankly, a lot of progress over the past 20 years in, in things like our renewable energies, um, waste, water, all these types of things. And in transportation, we're pretty much in the same field we space we were when I started, which is sort of depressing. And it's because <laughs> <laughs> transportation, Specifically, and, and this relates to city planning as well. It's the aggregate of everybody's individual decisions within a public forum. It's not like the energy sector where you have like only so many place, players in a regulated space. That's just not how it plays out. And so it's a lot harder. It's also one of the topics that has a lot of really strong federal leadership for good or for bad that sort of predetermines the actions that you can take. Um, and so that's kind of how I got into that space. And then through my work in transportation over time, I fell into like the larger role of planning. Um, right. So particularly when, you know, I guess when we all met, I was more of a planner. And now I've kind of gotten back into transportation policy. You know, what are the right decisions on the upfront when we don't have a lot of information? And what does that look like? Um, so that's kind of changed a bit, but I basically circle back and forth where like, when I go to planning discussions, I'm one of the few who really knows transportation. When I go to transportation, I'm one of the few who knows the environmental side. When I go to the environmental, they don't know what to do with me. So <laughs> I, you know, I kind of bridge this space. And then because it's planning, it's about, you know, a lot of on the ground, what, what do we want to achieve as communities? I think that's one of the things, lots of folks who work in transportation are concerned about the system. Um, and like what it does, I'm sort of more concerned with like what people can do with the system, right? broadly speaking. And that's where it really intersects a lot more with the planning side, but planning and transportation collectively are just very large fields at the end of the day. So I occupy one space in it and I've been working in that area, but really I've always sort of said is that it's like, how do we use transportation planning and policy to help achieve our community like livability and quality of life goals. So. Right. And I, th I think that's so important because so often, you know, we, we think about people in specialized fields that are really focused on one particular thing and maybe it's a little over specialized. So having that overlap is really important if you want to actually achieve a result for a community, a group of people. 
Um, it's not just about the what, it's about the why, the who, and, and you know, the how. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about current events, and we're going to get to the future of cities and, and like where we see ourselves headed, but let's talk about Texas for a second, because we just had a, so, a, a huge uh, infrastructure, energy infrastructure problem in Texas. And I know, you know, you have some experience in the energy field. Can you tell us like where you see this as having broken down? Like what was, what, what are the kind of the things that, um, from a city planning perspective, you feel like really failed here? I'm not as conversant on Texas in the grand scheme of things. That's because I'm from New Mexico and we mm. generally like to avoid Texas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I myself have driven across Texas four times. So like, <laughs> like all that far apart from it. I mean, I think Texas to sort of take it broadly is, you know, I mean, one of the things that's come up, right, is that the grid is sort of separated for a variety of cultural and political reasons. And I think that that's certainly part of it. But, you know, but Texas is a very, very large state and ge right. geographically large states when this sort of things happen, there it's tough. Like, I mean, Florida has the same problem when hurricanes come through. Everybody's got to deal with it. You know, I mean, it's not that that aspect of it. i mean i think the bigger thing is is that people weren't necessarily prepared because of past history and past history is not going to be a very good nor has it ever been frankly but right. even more now so now because of climate change and those impacts is going to be the worst predictor of your future behavior and that's actually where the scenarios become really important because you have to sort of say like it's not about what the world we want to live in it's it's how to prepare yourself for the many possibilities that may happen in the future. Right. And I would say, generally speaking, it doesn't sound like Texas really ever took that seriously. And I'm, I, they're not unusual in that. I look at you, Florida, you're winning that one. Too. <laughs> uh, Got my eye on you, Florida. <laughs> yeah, right, like, I, can always, I can always bring it back to Florida. I, it's, I still follow a lot of the stuff there. Um, but you know, I mean, I, and it's a problem, it's a challenge. Um, and we do have, and, and I think that's really where, where the bigger, bigger problems are. I mean, when you start to get into the minutia of it, of that like problem, I mean, there's just a lot of people suffering and you know, there's lots of planning that I think that's the other thing. People think planning happens like in their local communities, but things like infrastructure planning, like big infrastructure, that doesn't happen at a community level for the most part. That happens at a state level and most people don't participate in those. I'll be honest. Right. Like I myself am participating as a stakeholder in a in a state level transportation planning. And it's just, it doesn't, people don't get excited about it as much. It's just, and it's because it's so far away, but by the time the project comes to your community, there's been five years of planning already done. It's it's hard. Like it doesn't match up with people's ability to interact with it. That's one of the biggest challenges, frankly, is how to have a more dynamic planning process where you go out and you're sort of changing it where you don't say like, we're gonna build this and your life is gonna be so much better. You sort of say, okay, we're gonna try a few things. <laughs> right. right. Like that's a very different trust paradigm. One that frankly, we are just not historically prone to engage in. Right, so you're saying we're more- Should we? I don't know if there's a big record that suggests like, yes, trust the government. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very difficult thing for people trusting the government uh and i think a, a big problem is people just don't have any idea how they can get engaged or how they can impact some of these things because th these are big problems that we're facing energy is a huge problem infrastructure is a huge problem uh who owns what and who's responsible for what is it people just don't know those answers and they don't know how to get engaged or involved but we've got uh, I think you bring up a really good point, which is this idea that, you know, we've, we're planning for our past, right? We're planning for history. Climate change is, is changing things. COVID has changed things immensely. And so now we have to kind of dream up what we want and, and we don't really know based on our past. It's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ironically, so a lot of the scenario planning work that's been done historically was really done by the oil companies that, that entire approach right. was by Shell. But it serves a lot of purposes, right? Um, you can sort of sit here and say, like, what does it look like if, you know, uh, climate change plays out in one way? What does it look like if a lot of things continue to be outsourced? Like, you can start to play with these sort of stories, and and it's not foolproof by any stretch of the imagination. But it's also not a process people are super comfortable with, right? Because then what you're saying is, is that we're going to pick the projects, the plans, the policies that work for m most of these, or are ourselves best amongst them, which means they may fail. And that's a right case, I think for people just in general, like most people don't like, I mean, 
Did you guys ever sit down and be like, all right, let's figure out how this is going to work. We're going to have the three kids and we're going to figure it out. And we're going to play out these forms of scenario. Like people <laughs> like to sit down and think about their lives that way. Um, and so but I think the, that's, that's, that's your job, right? Your job is to think about our lives that way. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know, you know, like, give it another two years and I'll tell you how you did. Um, <laughs> No, but I think that is sort of like a challenging space. And and it's just as challenging for people in government and public policy. So, and in some cases it's actually, you know, maybe better not to have it be more of a government space. And I say that as someone who's always worked in public policy, but never has actually received a straight government paycheck. So. Right, right. So you, you've always worked as a subcontractor to municipalities or, or what? I've been a consultant for most of that time. So I've like my clients would have been the federal government, state governments, local governments. I think at any, I think for the total number of places, like I've worked in about 33 states in just different ways. Um, uh, but I've worked where I'm sort of unusual is I've worked all the way from like the local level. Like I, at one point, Kissimmee was one of my clients, right? Um, and all the way up to the federal government. So I've right. never done any United Nations work. Can't right. say it. But yeah, uh, Jason says things have happened to Texas that have never happened in modern society. Florida has been subjected to hurricane for years. That's a great point. We are, yeah. you know, <laughs> Texas was not ready for this by any stretch of the imagination. And it's fascinating because I've got people on both sides of the political aisle and they, they both have their gut political reactions to this. Um, you know, people are, you know, immediately saying that, oh, this is because y'all are trying to rely too much on, on renewable or green energy. And, you know, this, I, I think the problem is most people just don't understand what the in infrastructure is. And so they jump to their political base to try to place blame. Yeah. I mean, I would argue that like infrastructure, generally speaking, is complicated. Like, I know it sounds funny, but like, <laughs> I don't know that like I've ever met a big infrastructure project that came in on time on budget and on scope. I mean, <laughs> oh no. And I don't mean like just mine, right? Like I don't really build things. So it's not, but like, you know, the big, the big dig is always a classic, but really like there's lots of examples of that. I remember listening to one podcast that was really funny where they're like, can we just give up on that? Like, and just call it a day because like it's there, it's almost impossible to do when you don't have this you know, perfect information around an engineering project. I mean, engineers are, they go in and they try and solve it, but they go with the best ideas. But like a lot of that stuff doesn't necessarily work out. I mean, I think in the case of Texas, my understanding is, is that a lot of it was that like, it wasn't winterized. Right. And which if you look on the past, right, historically that would have never happened. That's 100% true. But if you've looked at any climate models, that wasn't totally unrealistic. You know, if you right. look in that space. So some of it's like deliberate choices. And I'm not saying they predicted this exact storm under this exact circumstances, but you know, I've right. been following that field for 15 years. They have been basically climate scientists and climate policy people have been basically saying we are going to see more variability in the weather, a hands right. down. Yeah. Bigger storms, more extremes, all these kinds of and things you didn't expect to have happen happen more regularly. <laughs> like right. Like one would argue that if you were in Texas, which does get snowstorms, they're not common, but it's not impossible, you know? Right. That wasn't a crazy thing to to then put into your plans as a possibility. It's not right. guaranteed. I'm not suggesting that, but like if you were a planner like 10 years ago in Texas to sort of sit here and say, like, maybe we should explore some of these things, like what might happen, that you know, politically may not have been a, a possibility. Mm. But from like a knowledge perspective, it certainly was. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah. And, and, and to your point, I mean, you know, people have known this is a potential. I think the problem is that it's, it's more about money and, uh, you know, political will than it really is about, you know, us knowing whether or not this could happen. I mean, it's obvious that this could happen. It's just the fact that they had, there was no political will to do anything. And the people who were making the money didn't want to do any, they didn't want to lift a finger. Well, and competing interests. I mean, we have a political system that's sort of structured around this, not just a political system, but an entire governmental system. You know, I mean, I like I I I always caution people like to not blame things on the political because like the political is us. Like, I mean, it is like you participate. You are part of it. You don't participate. You are part of it, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> like, like, like it's a, to to. I, I, you know, I mean, to be very like 1973 feminist, like the personal is political and that's 100% true. And even if you don't want it to be. Right. I mean, even, even the personal will like people, but to, to, I mean, there, there is this very different thing about a person living their individual life and voting once every two years or whatever. And, you know, expecting 
policymakers to actually have the best interests in mind. And I think that this this what we saw in Texas was was very much a you know, like I would have never thought of that. Even if I lived in Texas, I wouldn't have been like, I wonder how our infrastructure is. Do- I wonder how our energy infrastructure is doing and if it can c- handle the capacity well, but, of. A- I mean, like you guys started talking about or he he met, he made that comment. I can't remember who. But and then I started thinking, well, if the same thing did happen here, which isn't entirely impossible, <laughs> we might be a little bit better in place because we all half of us have generators right we know how to use them right right Uh, right (laughs) our house that had two fireplaces and a fire pit in florida at the time for some reason (laughs) (laughs) i I mean everybody was like oh it gets cold there and i was like i guess no i'm sorry that's like a you know but yeah it's pretty fun but i think about like what if it would happen here like we get snow in hawaii on top of the mountains uh, uh, you know, the volcanoes, right? That's the only right. place you actually get snow. And I was like, what if that lake, I mean, I don't think it can, to be honest. I think it's really tough. Right. But you know, if you're going to start down that path, like we are, I don't know, we don't own pants anymore. Half the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, these are closed toed shoes. It's been over a year. I haven't been to the office. So. Right. Right. Um, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot that we need to think about, especially when we're starting to plan for the future and the future of cities. COVID has taken us in a very different direction. I think there are people who honestly believe that this, you know, cities are actually not going to be that important moving forward because of people's fear of living in close quarters. But I don't actually see that. I don't I don't think people are I don't think people want to. I think people love cities too much. They love the interaction. They love the engagement. They love uh, the community aspect of cities, um, and and they're so important. I think from a you know from a a network of citizens throughout a country, like major cities make up the the network of the country. Um, but we need to figure out new ways from an ecological standpoint to to fight climate change, um, and then develop new ways of understanding how we can live in cities and and for them to be productive and um, really valuable to not only our you know not only our uh, our our play but our work. What do you like? What's your vision for what cities are going to look like from your perspective in the in public transit and city planning? Like, where do you see us headed over the next twenty years with uh, with new technologies, energy, that sort of thing? Well, I think a big part of it depends on like what cities we're ta- what city we're talking about. Okay. Um, because when you look at, and I mean, I don't mean to bring it back to climate change, but it's probably because the last few places I've lived, actually every place I've lived for the last, in the last 20 years is going to have some real challenges associated with it, either from sea level rise, which is not the problem in Orlando, but is right. with the Florida. Oh, we're um, going to have, we're going to have lakefront, pro- we're going to have seafront property here in Orlando. You're also going to have a lot of climate refugees <laughs> over time. I mean, that right. story has already started for everybody who escapes Miami to live in Orlando. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, yeah. I think like it really depends on where we're talking about it. And so like that, that is one big change. I do agree with you. I don't see people abandoning cities. I mean, I think there is somewhat of a like certain class of people who are like, oh, I could go work anywhere. Let's go test that theory out. But at the end of the day, cities provide just so much of a human experience. And, you know, despite, you know, I would say like the influenza like in 1817 like people did not abandon cities after that at all right. and they could have much more so i mean you had the start of the um the trolley car suburbs had already started by then so there was some of that um maybe not to the extent as you got after world war ii but um yeah i don't i don't see that i think the challenges are is that it particularly in this country what like when people say cities they think of really dense communities mm-hmm. right um you know they think of the big cities and the really urban dense ones but the reality is is most of our communities are sort of in this like low lower density city scenario that's mm-hmm. you know in the four four to six stories kind of space and that's the main area and then you know around it is like you know kind of the suburbs and it's this sort of like urban suburbanization space um sometimes called inner suburbs but like you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more sprawly and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a big, I mean, that's a big problem in itself, right? Urban sprawl is, has its, it comes with its own set of problems. And I think that like, you know, we're, we're going to eventually have, we we need to deal with those from a transportation perspective, from a carbon emissions perspective. Um, you know, and the, the thing that surprised me so much with COVID 
was at the very, very beginning, I was thinking that our stupid urban sprawl in our space might be actually something right. that gave us an advantage right. as far as the spread was concerned. Right. Nope, we're the biggest winner. All right, so one terminology is that I don't know that we exist in a couple of where has urban sprawl. We usually call it suburban sprawl. Right, right, right. Right. We'd be if we had urban sprawl, right? Like where the urban areas were proliferating and growing and financially right. supported by the federal, state, and local governments in a way right. that we don't for our inner for our communities that are urban. But um, sorry, it was throwing me off. I was like, I don't know. No, sorry. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot of that. Um. I mean, realistically, to deal with a lot of these challenges, um, it looks pretty different. Um, it looks like a world where only like maybe 30% of people drive themselves to work every day. And I don't mean like telecommute, I mean the rest of them have sort of taken to, like we know what it looks like. It looks kind of like cities, but it doesn't have to be like Manhattan cities. It could be like parts of DC. It could be parts of downtown Orlando and the surrounding urban communities. It could be, you know, in Albuquerque, it's, you know, the older town area. We sort of can fit the same amount of people. There's this great graphic from Cleveland, I think it is. I'd have to look it up. But basically, it shows the population of Cleveland in 1950 compared to like 2000, 2010 or something. It's the exact same. Really? Region. But what's changed is that it's three times as large. So you, right. if you, you could go and fill all that back in mm -hmm. without a demonstrable change. It's just so many of our systems are sort of geared towards not supporting that you know like so for everybody who goes and buys a single family home which lots of people want to do and lots of people end up doing further out than they'd like to for a variety of reasons but a lot of times then you're forced to buy a car so that's an expense right, right? and lots of other times the amount of money you've paid in property taxes to serve that that space is not what it costs i mean that's one of the biggest challenges is that like you know i don't i i I, try, I, you know, I don't want this to come across as judgmental about people who want to own their own home out in a sort of more, you know, what we right. consider a more suburban area where they have that space. It's not meant to judge, to put judgment on it, but that price is not reflected in the price people pay. Like you don't, like whatever, like a lot of, I mean, this is less so in Florida, but in lots of places, because of the way the tax plays out in Florida, the property taxes are quite high by comparison. Right. The property taxes you're paying don't actually cover the price of all the services. And so that is, you know, like it doesn't cover the, the fact that it costs that X amount of much more to provide water, electricity, all those sorts of things that sometimes gets covered by the impact fees. But in a lot of cases that that covers the upfront cost, but it doesn't cover the maintenance costs. And so, so where, where's the money coming from? I mean, if, if, if the property tax aren't covering it, where who's paying for it? I mean, who says they are? <laughs> like, like that sort of presumes that the amount of money you're getting is keeping a system in good repair. But in most cases, there is an identical mm. amount of money. That's the maintenance backlog that the budget doesn't cover. Right. And this is maybe this is part of the reasons why things like Texas and, and are happening, because there isn't the, the, the money to repair the infrastructure or to Im ensure that the infrastructure is ready for something that is is beyond the expectation. Yeah, actually, I was reading a really interesting article about how, like, the governmental accounts standing board, apparently, you know, they, they look at all of their infrastructure as assets instead of liabilities. And so what does that do when people start thinking about it when like it really has a maintenance cost? So it's not just right. yeah. and what does that do? Because then it's not clear, like in your government documents, what's what's being done. Um, I mean, I like one of the I'm actually going to talk about someone else's work. Here we go. OK, so <laughs> there was actually this really interesting study and I'm going to shout out to Stevie Olson in Texas now. Um, or no, he's in New Mexico right now. Sorry. But he was at Harvard when he, they, he and his team did this study um, at the Kennedy School and they basically assessed the entire vehicle economy of Massachusetts. And it's sixty four billion dollars when you add up all the direct and indirect costs. So wow. then, and of course, you ask is it's like, OK, so like who's paying attention to that and who's like deciding like what we spend our money on and we don't spend our money on that number is not a number people work in at a state transportation level. Like that's not part of the question I offer up as a counter example. Florida Department of Transportation just last month released their macroeconomic study that said for every dollar spent that Florida DOT spends, there's a four dollar return on investment. OK, fair enough. I, I didn't dive into the specifics, but I'd like to point out that they didn't actually put the costs associated with everybody driving in Florida, 
when seven right. out of the 10 metropolitan areas are the worst place to be a biker and a pedestrian in the country. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, for so, sure. so you can talk about four to one, but the question is, and what are the costs associated with that? Like, what is that? How does that play out at the end of the day? And that just that kind of thinking, I feel like it doesn't, um, it just doesn't like match up. And and right. it's you know, I think it's hard because like there are lots of reasons why, and you know, people are just trying to keep the systems running and working. And there's a lot of like validity to that approach. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, the executive functionally is supposed to implement the policies as dictated and set out by the legislature. Right. Right. And I mean, I think there's lots of examples where that's not entirely true, but you know, there, there can be limitations. I mean, what, for years in Florida, you weren't allowed to talk about climate change and planning. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. There was, I mean, that was, I don't know if it was like an official moratorium or if it was just like, if you worked in the field, but yeah, it was, Wow. I feel like that was like, I don't know, last 10 or 15 years, maybe on and, and off. And, and, and you think, and you think that might, I mean, like people just, they just couldn't or didn't. And it was just like a faux pas or like you literally were not supposed to bring it up when considering the planning aspects of your, of your job. Oh, <laughs> I remember. I feel like it was sort of, you know, it gets conveyed in a lot of ways, like through right. the legislative discussions. Um, but there well, are how lot creepy is that when you're saying that you have to plan on stuff like 10 years before you even begin to implement it? We know we're already behind on climate change. And then if they're just talking about it now in right. Florida, have they even started talking about it in Arkansas yet? Right. Or Texas? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, yeah, it depends. There are regional differences too. I mean, that does happen. You know, we are a very decentralized, fragmented system in that regard. So, right. you know, people can sort of do things and be creative. It happens, but you know, the system as a whole is fairly, fairly stable. Frankly, I mean, well, it reminds me of like you're talking about the assets, and you're talking about a mis misunderstanding of the economics, and and so we see that in so many aspects of of climate, right, and and, and economics, because we don't understand the impacts of carbon, and so those things are not taxed. Those things are not, you know, we're not we're not playing we're not putting pollution in into the cost of what it's going to take in order to solve these problems and we're just saying you know well we're making money we're you know it's we're, we spend a dollar make four but yeah well what what about all of the long-term you know carbon emission based problems that you're going to see because of that and and it's just not accounted for yeah i mean i think a lot of the planning community does try to account for that but then there are things that pop and there's there's fiscal realities right like it's not like florida's sitting here being like let's tax more people either to make up for this problem nope. like, that, like i mean like occasionally people have a tendency to vote for things when it's really explicit what you're what you're paying for right like you might have a transit referendum and then people are like, it's going to pay for these like th two transit lines, these intersection improvements and this, and those almost over, almost always overwhelmingly win. If you tell people we need a tax increase because we need to just run government properly, like nobody, right. nobody votes for that, unfortunately. Right. And then there's like legislators who have to take the hit for it, you know? So like, I think there is, um, you know, I, I like there's a reality around that where like nobody wants to sign up for tax increases a lot. I mean, not nobody. I myself usually vote for them and I'm fine with them. But like I have a slightly different perspective. But generally right. speaking, people just feel like the prices are being raised arbitrarily. And and one of the ways we get around that is we make it linked to a very specific outcome. Mm, what do you mean by that? Like, again, like transit refer referendums, generally speaking, across the country are very successful. I want to say, I mean, I'm making this number up, so like, don't quote me on it. But like, generally speaking, I would say I feel like the number is like 60 to 70 percent of them almost pass, and that's like over 20 years, right? So, right. Um, I think so right. regardless of whether or not we can pay for it, yeah. So like, but but they're always like, it's this slate of projects. This is what you're increasing your sales tax is going to go towards funding. It's our local match, and then the federal government like picks up certain pieces of it, and it's this is how we get it going. And that's generally how, like, those are the sorts of things people have a tendency to vote for. Open space preservation, you know, that quarter cent sales tax kind of stuff. That's the stuff people will vote for in taxes. If you go in and you sort of say, we're going to raise everyone's, like, you know, income tax, or we're going to raise your property taxes, and we just need it to run good government, that's a... Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not a very sexy thing to to want to pay for. Um, yeah, I mean, so Florida won't even tax your income, right? Like, it's all, I was, you know... 
we came to Hawaii where the property taxes are a lot lower. And I was like looking at some of them like on people's properties. And I was like, oh my God, they would crack, be totally blown away by how much I paid in Florida. Right, right. Um, what do you think? So from a transit perspective, what do you think of like, you know, Uber and p potentially Tesla, Tesla self-driving cars? Um, do you think this is going to, cause we're not really tackling this issue of, of good transportation in cities with, with Uber and, and, uh, you know, self-driving automation because, you know, there's so much space required for a car versus what it would, what it would take to transport somebody through, you know, a train or a bus or, or whatever that looks like, where do you see this headed? I mean, it's like, where do I want to see it headed versus well, both? I want to, I want to hear both. Yeah. I want to see where you want to see it headed and then where you actually think it's headed. I mean, I think it's open-ended, you know, as much as I talk about how lots of things have not changed over the past 20 years in transportation, when it comes to it, we have these pockets though, where, you know, communities are down in like, you know, 30% aren't you know driving and and you have these spaces where um like transit is really vibrant even if it's not fully covered by bus fares right um portland's a good one i mean 20 years ago i went yeah. for four years without a car yeah right the good public yeah. transportation where most places really don't in the united states i mean you've got where, where you know you've got some cities that have decent public transportation yeah. but you know orlando it's, it's horrific Okay, I'm going to weirdly defend Orlando for a second on this. <laughs> um, I can't. Um, <laughs> you want to, do, you want to defend Orlando. I'm just, I'm talking about like, at the end of the day, when they shit this family, when, when, when I live, you know, when I live off 50 and I need to go downtown to Orlando and I don't have a car, like there's nothing for me. The, the bus is a horrible option. So, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm pr I, okay, so we're gonna get into this fun land where I'm gonna call you on privilege right now, okay? Because okay. Like, you have the ability to have another option, but like there was a great tweet out of San Francisco and the MTA today that says, or with BART, and it says, don't tell me nobody's riding BART. 47,000 people got on the train today. Right. And in Honolulu today, probably, 60 or 70,000 people got on the bus today. So when we say things like that, we're dismissive of the fact that there are lots of people in this country every given day getting on the bus for a variety of reasons, because it, it works for them, because they don't have another choice. Um, but that, but that's my point. That's my point. I'm defending those people because they that's don't, the that's the best, that's the, that's the best option they have. And it's a shitty option for them because it takes yeah. so much well, time. I don't know the schedule, but out here, like we have a lot of bus stops. Not that I'm driving every day, but when I do go by them, I maybe see one or two people. I, it doesn't seem like they're well frequented. Like over here at the Walmart, I know that there's the one woman who sits in the same booth all day because she's every day there when I see her. So she just hangs out there. I don't think she's riding the bus. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, where y'all live is, is not <laughs> like where transit <laughs> is a vibrant choice. Let's be honest. I, I don't mean that like, it, it's just true. No, no, we know. You're further <laughs> outside of the city. But if you go down to parts of Paramore and other though, areas where the circulators are, where, you know, I mean, there's been plans for a long time to have a BRT on 50 that runs up and down Colonial on 15 minute intervals. Like those would be game changers in a lot of ways because you have the densities in the ridership areas. Um, you know, some of the rides, Prior to COVID, it's been a long time since I've looked at the Lynx yeah. rider numbers. So, you know, to anybody who knows me that's from Florida and I'm getting them wrong, I apologize. But like, you know, on, on their top ridership numbers are, you know, 40,000 people, like 30,000 people. So they have some real numbers behind right. them. Um, but it, but it, you know, but then you compare that to how much money, you know, in five years is being put into I-4 to expand it. To improve right. intersections, you know, I think I calculated it beyond the I four ultimate would have paid for ten years of double service on links. Right, right. and that I mean, becomes a tourism issue, though, too, doesn't it? Because you can't it, tourists aren't going to ride the local bus. I mean, bus they do in other communities, right? Yeah. Like it's not as if like nobody ever does it. It just it, it a lot of it comes down to where and. And, you know, there are a lot more requirements on transit in terms of like wh how you qualify for federal funding, particularly on the capital side, like what do you have to report on, like all that kind of stuff. They're just much more 
onerous. I mean, generally speaking, roadway projects get federally reimbursed at 80 percent. Historically, it was 90 percent. I mean, you go in for a new transit capital project. Best case scenario is 50 percent. Um, wow. I mean, it, it like predetermines your solutions. It takes a lot yeah. of work to overcome that. And and we see that people are willing to do that work. Right. Like there's been lots of new transit systems built in the past 10 years, 20 years. Um, you know, Tampa's got a few things going in, you know, Miami's got the nine with the six BRT routes. I can't remember now. It's been a while. Um, you know, there's been extensions. Charlotte's entire system has been built in the last 15 years, you know, so, so there's still an interest in it for the reasons we talk about. Like it's the easiest way to move like just from a basic geometry perspective, right? When you start evaluating projects on how many people are being moved versus how many cars are being moved. You're, you know, what wins changes dramatically. Um, and we haven't necessarily made that shift. In most places, they still use this metric called level of service, which is how fast free flowing traffic work goes. Right. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, that was a fair enough metric, right? Like we didn't have the ability, but now we have like the data capabilities to access, uh, to assess things like, like how many opportunities can you reach within 15 minutes by foot? Like we can do that now in a way we couldn't do 30 years ago. And so really like we have to start reassessing our investments on accessibility, on a multimodal accessibility basis. And that's a, that's a hard change. I mean, like just this past year to pick on Florida again, right? Um, there was like what, like three or four highways proposed by the expressway authority to come, it was MCORS, I think is what it's called. I mean, that's a, that's, that wasn't there three years ago. This is a totally new project. And all that does is just encourages people to drive more. The right. authority in Florida, generally speaking, has like so much power. It's it's kind of sad, actually, I think. Like, I don't think local communities can override the expressway authority's decisions, which seems crazy to me, but. Right. Yeah. Do you think that's because there's so much more tourism here? Like, do you see that, do you find that in states with less tourism? What, that you can't override things? Yeah, no, like the, oh, no, the power, the power. <laughs> what? I said that's common everywhere. No, I mean, tourism is oh, is a big part of everybody's community now. I don't think I've ever worked in one where either they had a lot of tourists and were either complaining about it or yeah, it had to be something that was to be managed or they wanted more for the economic development. Right. Even right. small towns. I, I worked in one in Nebraska at one point where like the big sell, like the big thing that they had done was they had put in a, a four bedroom hotel. I mean, it was like 1500 people in Nebraska, <laughs> but like that was a big thing for them so that people had some place to stay when they came to visit family and sort of look at the river, I think is what it was. <laughs> right. So what I do you think? Like Nebraska, clearly. <laughs> 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 nope. Um, so what do you think are like the biggest technological um, changes that we're going to see in public transportation over the next year? Is there, will we see, um, will we see solar having an impact here? Will we like, will, will we be able to get to green energy? Cause I, I think the biggest problem that we face is carbon emissions, right? So we're going to see a huge problem uh, with climate change and we need to be able to build infrastructures. You know, we, like you said earlier, we have a very loose, um, you know, uh, system in, in our country because everybody, every state's different, every city's different, every municipality's different. They're not talking to each other. Um, how do we actually begin to transport goods and transport people in ways that are, that are green and efficient that reduce carbon emissions? I mean, if I figured this out, I would probably be out of the job by now. So <laughs> you know, you'd have a better job. <laughs> I I don't know this one. I I really enjoy it's this. It's pretty before. sweet. So okay. It is sweet. So, um, so I wish. Okay, so I will push back, and that I don't think technology is as much the answer. Unfortunately, um, I mean, Lyft and Uber and to certain degree autonomous vehicles, if they continue on the trajectory that they're sort of well, one of the trajectories they're headed, which is that they increase VMT. There's more deadheading, and it doesn't really just adds to congestion in our wait, community. Wait, so break, break down some of those terms. I don't I don't know what deadheading is. Oh, that's where you drive around as a Lyft or Uber driver look, waiting for rides to come in. So uh, you're okay. function like a taxi does. But but remember, Lyft was originally like people driving around to their destination and, and making an extra buck or two while they were going to work. It wasn't right. structured as a taxi replacement service, which it's functionally become for a lot right. of people. Um, but most of the studies suggest that it's adding to congestion. So like more cars, more people driving, 
it's not really helping that scenario, even though it was originally sort of structured, I originally to be that kind of option. Um, I, I mean, the thing that I think I would really, like if I was gonna tell people, and, and I recognize that this requires money, is, is that we don't need more technologies. We need people to build out the sidewalk network. We need to make the world accessible for people who are mobility impaired at the end of the day, because that works for everyone. Um, and that doesn't happen. Um, so you're saying you're saying the future of of good cities and reducing carbon emissions is really about accessibility. It's about design. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I would throw out that a lot of these are so much cheaper than what you'll hear being put out there for climate change and technology solutions. Like an autonomous vehicle at the end of the day, even as a service, is still going to be expensive. Walking is still the cheapest form of travel, provided there's things to walk to. Right. It's not everywhere. It's tough. Um, you know, and a lot of places have been designed around um, recreational walking as opposed to like walking for function. Right. Um, and, and because we build so little of it in this country, the price point of it is so much higher, right? Like there's a reason why you, y'all live out in a, a Koei, right? Is, I mean, it was an affordable house. You didn't have jobs that were necessarily downtown as much at the time, from what I remember of our stories from a few, you know, and that makes sense. But where you're at regards walking as a pastime, not yes. as a necessity. Mm -hmm. and so that building block, I mean, you, you can certainly get to the publics from your house, but like, I don't, Kristen, I mean... Unless you get that trike. She that, did. I do. I have it. Oh, that's right. You did. So, okay. So you could trike there, really, if yeah. you want to. But you kind of have to be motivated. And it's not straight. Like, right. you know, bird's eye, you, that would be a, a probably a, a great shot. But you have to go right. out and around and, like, loop. And that's re you, that experience is 100% very common across America. And so we have to talk about, instead of building on greenfields, like, how do we reconfigure those spaces? Right. That, it, sometimes it's super easy. Sometimes it's taking, like, you know, the super the commercial area that has like the supermarket and a few shops in it, but has like a crazy amount of parking, right? Just a crazy right. amount of parking. And you rip some of that parking up and you put in an apartment building. Like it, sometimes it can be as simple as that, but in other places, it's gonna be more complicated. It's It yeah. just is, but we're also not spending our energy as much. Like, well, and it's not as intentional, right? I mean, isn't it isn't like if, if we're going to be good engineers and good stewards of the future, right, then we need to be much more intentional about how we design communities so people can live, work and play. I mean, this is it sounds so simple, right? But it's it's like it's that's the solution, well, isn't it? Just like the level of ineptitude. Like, I don't know what kind of like schooling you have to do to be approved as the guy who sets up the plans for the mall over here where cyber works but literally like the worst way you could design anything for causing accidents for not waking places for pedestrians to walk right like you need to drive from one store to the next store if you don't want to get killed i don't know they have people's loading docks middle in the middle of the street it's not it's not safe right. So I'm not going to defend whoever designed that property. Although watch, like you do this, and then someone texts me, dude, I know who did that, right? <laughs> Because I don't, I don't know, but like, given that I know what a mall looks like, let's just, but, but one of the things is, is that if, if a community hasn't sat down and outlined what they want from development and put certain things in place, which is effort, mind you, right? Like you've got to have like the community sort of interested. You've got to have city council people who are going to approve it. And then you've got to have staff who are willing to sort of like put it down, right? Like, so it does take effort. If you don't have that, then whatever is approved for that plat, you, if you go in and change it after someone puts in a proposal, that's a taking. Like we all have to pay them for the loss of that property. So mm -hmm. I do flag that because that is actually like a big piece of why things don't, is like if you haven't gone to that place, like like out where y'all are, like most of that area has been structured as a, as a suburban division. Like, mm -hmm. and unless like, they've gone back and fixed that and changed that in a lot of places. Like you don't have a lot of way of telling them, okay, this is it, you know, this is, we'd like you to do these sorts of things differently. And then people get kind of up in arms, right? Like when this development comes in or whoever did what, and they're like, this isn't what we wanted. And you're like, yeah, but, but when they bought the property, they didn't know that. And you know, if we tell them they can't do it, then we have to compensate them for that. And and I'm not entirely sure that's like the worst thing, right? Like nobody wants to be told what they can and cannot be do with their property after the fact, right? Right. 
one thing going in, but afterwards, like we get kind of fussy about that here in this country for a variety of reasons, good or bad. But that is one of the, like that's sort of one of the built-in structural challenges, right? Is that like, and because suburban sort of zoning for lack of a better term took off like wildfire in this country at one point like basically the professionalization the expansion of planning and engineers and traffic engineers and all this kind of stuff happened at the same time we were pushing out suburban lifestyles that's like the norm right so like, that's the easy thing that's the thing that doesn't require you to get exemptions from the city and the only places that are sort of exempt from that stuff are usually older city cores that were laid out differently so like mm -hmm. You know, and even like when we build new ones, right? Like when we build these more sort of like new neo-traditional households, like celebration is sort of the local example, but like they're still really expensive. And and like if you're still gonna drive, because like even though you might have this neighborhood, but it doesn't have everything that the entire region offers, because we don't have a bigger transit system, people don't make that trade-off. Like I've lived places where like I could walk to work and I could do all that stuff, but I couldn't get to a grocery store. So I bought a car. Right. You know, I mean, that's a really common trait or my favorite. Oh, what was it? It wasn't. I, and I felt like I could probably swing the car thing, except they, the bus didn't run on Sundays. Right. Mm. For 50 percent of my ability, you know, and I was like 22 and this is, you know, and like by myself. So it's not like I had a lot of groceries. It's not like right. I was trying to do, you know, with my family where it's like, you know, three carfuls of food. But like. You know, and and I think people make those calculations all the time, and and it's because the system just doesn't work towards that, and that's a well, big challenge. You right, and you brought up an interesting point. You said that you know since the since the fifties, sixties, seventies, we've been you know just kind of suburban sprawling, and it's been you know it's driven by by uh, money, right? It's driven by people who want to start businesses and and create malls and and do all these sorts of fun things, and it just builds this huge suburbia. Um, you know, and people have to buy a car because they have to travel to the store and they can't get to the store. They can't get to work without a car. And so we've built like we've we've got so much momentum behind yep. what we've been creating for so long. And and you're kind of saying, well, we need to step back and say, like, the people need to have the will to step up and start, you know, communicating to the city councils and to the planners of what they want. And, and they want to build communities where they live, work and play. And um, is that what you're kind of saying? I mean, that's part of it, but I don't wanna like let legislators and people who do this professionally off the hook either. I think we all have to ask ourselves the question, like what are the things that the community has expressed to date that they find important to themselves, right? I mean, like that's a real question. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's one thing to ask, you know, you guys, you have your, your jobs, you're working, you're doing all these other things, right? Like how much responsibility do you have when you're doing all those things, raising kids, doing to come in and tell the city of Ocoee what you want. Right. We, we don't. We don't. I, I don't have the, I, I don't. It's not a fair burden, right? Like, so like the city needs, I think lots of governments also need to make this effort and not say to say like, what do you want for your community? But throw out ideas. Like anybody who says to you, we want to know what your vision is for this community, doesn't want to do the hard work of trying to come up with some ideas for themselves. Like what are the five ideas we've got? How could we grow differently? What could we do differently? What are the changes in the tax code that would help us do these things? Like none of, like that's, like that should be your professional staff and that doesn't happen as much. So now I'm ragging on planners and frankly engineers because engineers, <laughs> in my opinion, almost never ask this question. They're sure. always like, okay, what's the problem? And then what do the books tell me? And I'll just apply these metrics. But that's probably unfair too. I'm going to get right. ragged by engineers. Yeah, see, I, I tricked you into ragging on the planners by saying it was the people's problem. No, I it's everybody's <laughs> problem. I mean, I if someone comes to your door, it, I mean, even like with a flyer and says, please fill out this survey and tell us like what's important to you and you don't answer it. That's on you. Yeah, sure. To a certain degree, like, right. Like a lot of times nobody even bothers asking. So, you know, if, right. it, if it's not too onerous and stuff like that, it, when but I, but you send you that survey and you speak Spanish or like here, if you speak, um, like Locano and like, okay, you've got to pass in my opinion, but like outside of those kinds of situational things, like, like, I think that that's actually the public space. Like, I think we should be concerned with those people who can't just make things happen all the time. And that's what like, and, and planning should be about those types of questions. It's not just about like, what's the community gonna look like, but but we get lots of ideas about how that should go, right? right. And, and it just depends on where you're at, right? But like, you know, so people sort of always put out the same things. Like if you ask people envisioning exercises in any given place across the country, they will almost, I swear, and I, I don't have the studies to prove this up, but it feels like a truism to me, is that 
they will pick almost smart growth, <laughs> right? <laughs> like they'll pick this like density, they'll pick the where they want transit, they want options, they want all these sorts of things, right? They will, but they'll always shy away from like the full manifestation of it. So it's like this, it, everybody picks the hybrid as far as I can tell. Right. Yeah. And so that tells us some things, but it doesn't tell us everything. And I think like, you know, and depending on people who only participate in planning activities, like one of the things we've been working a lot on is going out and doing quick builds, which is like where you start taking space and you use that as the conversation starter. So you use these semi-permanent options to decide if something works and if it's meeting community needs. Like that's a different dynamic. And that's a really important switch that needs to happen in the planning community and needs to happen, frankly, in the infrastructure community, which is like, are there ways that we can test out if things are going to work for people without having a planning process necessarily, without right. like, like right. you know, or you ask them, I remember one year there was like, I got asked to be involved as a citizen. So not even as a planner. So like I knew about all of them, but like in five different planning processes, one was like a sustainability one, one was a transportation one, one was the housing one, one was the age friendly one. And then there was like another green infrastructure plan. Asking people to participate in that many plans and planning processes is just unfair. Right, right. Well, and we have to fix that problem. Like we know how to get at people in a lot of ways. Like, it's not like they don't know where you live. It's not like, I mean, mailers, you know, true, tried and true and traditional, but like you can still get a lot out of them. Um, but then I think changing things and then having people have a way to interact with the space and tell you what they think, that's a really different paradigm. And that's the one that needs to go forward a lot of the ways. Now, granted, you can't build a port like that and you can't build a, an entirely new road, but frankly, we don't need any new roads as far as I'm concerned. Right. Well, and one of the biggest things you, you brought up earlier was this idea of privilege, right? Because so many people, they have, they're busy. They're, they're busy with their lives. They're busy with their kids. They're barely making enough money to survive. And they don't have the ability to focus on, you know, getting that information out there. Sue brought this up, which is interesting. People don't even trust city officials enough to fill out the damn survey. No, I, um, was, I, I was so bad. What? Earlier this year. I think I told you I did this. I, um, <laughs> There was this there was this city survey from the city of Okoe about what I knew about my landscaping rules and fertilizing and lawn services. And I think you know this, Katie, but I hate grass more than like anything else on the face of the earth. So I literally tried to fuck their survey. <laughs> So that speaks exactly to the point Sue just made. Is that people people were literally my own wife like, will literally fuck the survey. So I didn't go as bad, but like <laughs> I got one from like our state representative about like how we felt about things. And basically Scott and I, like I took the curmudgeonly one because like it would be things like tax credits for electric vehicles. And I don't like tax credits, period. Even though I'm supportive of electric vehicles, if, if you have to drive, like, which is true for some people, like, right. Like for the vehicles that are on the road, I want them to be electric. I just want half as many vehicles a lot of the time. Right. Half as many vehicles, right. Um, Which is what good if we have if good public transportation helps with that, um, but it doesn't it doesn't solve everything, right? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, um, but you know what? I do implore people that like if you are passionate about this subject, going out and walking, <laughs> and, right. and taking advantage of whatever facilities are around your community, like that's important. Actually, yeah. um, like one, you know, there's a tipping point around there, so. That is an important space. Like people ask me a lot of times, like, well, what can I do right now? I said, go walk more, go bike more and go be present in those facilities. Because right now in a lot of communities, sometimes people aren't even using them when people drive by. Right. And, and it's something you can do tomorrow. Like we, we could all start walking more tomorrow. It may not be fun. <laughs> it may be a kind of a pain, but like it's, that is a step you can start taking. I mean, and it's more impactful than frankly buying an electric vehicle at the yeah. end of the day like because we don't actually need everybody to get out of their cars all the time we need like 30 percent of the people to get out of their cars 30 percent of the time you know mm. all it sort of shows that right is that like if you cut it like it's possible or people can shift things but in a lot of places particularly here like we saw a massive drop in the economics around it too so it, it doesn't come without its price but like th but we can shift congestion a lot i although i hate congestion as a metric that just means something's popular what, what do you what do you mean by that? It just well, means oh that people are going in that direction. Like there's something to be had there. Yeah, yeah. Like congestion as a metric. Like places that have no congestion, we usually don't want to go to. Right, right. right. You know, right. So, so it's like a weird right. metric to me. That's all. Like I don't. I I, I want to know how many things I can reach and how easily. And like, and anybody who drives any day, like, you should. 
if you can figure out a way to in your life to get rid of that commute, life changing. You, I like, I mean, I feel like a huge jump for mental health and it's not for everybody. I get that. But like, if you have the ability to opt into a different process, I highly recommend it. Right. So. Right. And, and, you know, and I think most people who could would. Um, so obviously it's not something that's just a, just a gimme, but I think your point about walking and using the services that are available to you tells the community that those things are valuable and to reinvest in those things. And I think when we talk about cities of the future and what we want to see in order to get there, we kind of have to, we kind of have to be not only pushing as individuals and, 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 you know, voting for people in in city and public offices who are wanting to get those things done. But then once we get them done, we actually have to utilize the services. I remember we built a community garden here in our neighborhood and mm -hmm. it was so cool. And I was so excited. We got everybody to come out. We built this beautiful community garden. It lasted for like uh, two years and then like everybody lost interest. And then just nobody, nobody, you know, took care of it and cared about it, well, including me. The teenagers wanted to destroy it. Well, yeah, the, the teenagers wanted to destroy it, too. And that was that was a problem as well. Um, but we didn't get the teenagers involved. Like we didn't, you know, so there are all kinds of ways, but I think to your point, it's very difficult to like, know. you know, I, I think we just need to do a better job of like going out and looking at places that are doing cool things that people are actually enjoying and it's making a difference and it's improving things. And then we, br we cherry pick those and build communities around those ideas I think is, is valuable. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's true. Um, I mean, I think part of it is also that like, it's, like building off of the things that are sort of more interesting, like in, like Orlando in particular has like 12 urban neighborhoods right around. There's a lot of infill that could happen in those spaces where people are like more centrally located without dramatically changing a lot of that space. So right. I'm gonna, we're gonna segue into my favorite topic because if you've got at least like five people who believe me, then this is a win, but like- <laughs> Okay, hit me. Parking, there's no such thing as free parking. We are all paying for it. Please get used to this. Break, 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 break that down for us. Okay, so one of the biggest determinants of like whether or not you can build infill or not is the parking requirements. When you, when you uh, define infill, please. Infill is like, so you have sort of a community that's got roads and like there might be an open lot or a house that, or a decrepit space that's not being used. And so you go okay. in, so it, greenfield development is when you build it like a hundred and you know, some odd thousand houses in the middle of nowhere and you're building everything from scratch, right? But infill is when you're in like a city already wow. and you come in and you say, okay, we're gonna build in this space. But one of the biggest limitations in most communities is the parking requirements. Mm. So, um, and parking spaces everything out. Parking makes it hard to provide transit. Off street and off on street parking requirements um, makes everything more difficult that we want to have happen for our cities. Right. At the end of it, just end all be all, and it adds a lot of cost. So here in Hawaii, we did a okay. Now I'm we did a study, but basically, like the cost of parking requirements prior to December. This was actually changed recently, but prior to December was. Um, would have easily add 20% of the cost of a condo unit in urban Honolulu. Now, unlike Orlando, urban Honolulu is like the second or third most expensive real estate market in the country. But we are similar to Orlando in that we are a tourist based economy. So I always joke that we have a joke. Uh, I always say that we have <laughs> oh, the husband's time to right? Um, <laughs> I always joke that we have Washington DC prices, but Orlando salaries. Okay. Right. And so like, that's a real problem at the end of the day, when you're talking about like, you know, you can maybe get a two bedroom condo in downtown Honolulu, maybe 400, 500,000. And a quarter of that is because you have to pay for parking in an area like that is actually really well served by transit. Our transit system here covers 95% of the island within 90 minutes. Right. Which um, is unusual. Like parts of Orlando, you'll have really good service, but it, it just depends to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, parking is like the biggest thing. If you are interested in this topic, there is a great video on Vox that talks about the high cost of free parking that features um, Don Shoup, who's basically created this field of inquiry over the past 20 years in the planning community. And there's just so many associated costs with parking. It makes things further away. It makes it harder to provide transit. It makes it less likely people walk. It increases the cost of housing. Um, you know, those stacked houses, right? Like when they build condos in, in downtown areas right. in Florida and like the the five floors of stacked parking. I mean, those are easily 40 or $50,000 a space. Right. You know, and right. you don't get a choice in the matter. That's the thing. You can't build, 
you can't like, I mean, you can go in and ask for exemptions but most people just build to the code. So, and but so doesn't, but doesn't, um, doesn't autonomous vehicle driving, isn't that a technology that would actually support that problem or, or help with that problem? Because then you're not deadheading, right? You're not, it's not. I mean, Uber. it depends on how the structures are around it, right? Like it's possible that what ends up happening is that the, say like you have an autonomous vehicle, at, you know, at your house, it takes you downtown or wherever your workspace is, the, your work set, it then comes back. And then when you want to come home, it comes and gets you and then takes it back. We have now doubled your vehicle miles traveled. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about people. Who, so the, so Musk's whole idea is that the you will be able to rent out your car while you're at work. So it's doing it's being an Uber while you're working. Yeah, I think the systems in place for that are just unlikely. So, well, so, I, so you don't think you don't think the technology is likely to work or you don't think no. that it's. I think the technology is further out, like because, for instance, the thing that that really depends on is pavement markings, right? Like you have to have really good, solid infrastructure in place. Like they're not autonomous; they're censored, they're connected. There's no autonomy in the sense that, like, you can't just set a car out in a system with no sensors on the road. That doesn't exist. That's not the technology paradigm we talk about. It. It's automated and it's connected. But it's not autonomous. It's not like it can you, it can drive exactly the way you were, like like off roading. There's no autonomous off roading. That doesn't happen. So it depends on this infrastructure investment, right? Well, so, I, I'm still I'm still confused because because yes, we're not there yet. the The autonomous <laughs> vehicles are not able to do that yet. But in ten years, you don't think they will be able to? I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not. No. Sure, I'm not sure. I understand what what you're saying about the technology that would keep it from being able to. We have mass, we have parts in this country, right? So maybe not cities necessarily, but we do have places in this country pretty easily in which your networks for cellular drop, right? So those are going to be black zones just at this current, maybe, right. maybe the technology improves, but I don't know that there's a big push for that. So there's going to be places where it just sort of drops, right? That's one thing. The second thing is, is that when you're in a city environment, you are getting data from your street lights. You're getting data from the pavement markings, right. you're getting data from cellular and all that stuff. I drive around or I have in my history of so many cities, we don't keep up pavement markings in an urban environment with pedestrians and bicyclists and people who like, even if autonomous vehicles are out there are probably like, even with the domination of vehicles in general, people still walk in this country. It happens, you know, it doesn't happen everywhere, but it happens. Right. So that's not going away. And if the markings aren't maintained, which they aren't in many communities currently, where does that leave you with an autonomous vehicle space over the long run? As a, a lot of the, the pilots right now, I mean, I think it's coming, but I think these are really important questions. The other question I sort of have, and this came out of a, a podcast I was listening about the ghost town who was talking about the autonomy. It just came out in the past month, but he was talking about like the financial models and how like it's probably going to get to a point where it's a monopoly service that it's probably going to be really hard to have like or that like there's going to be a lot of places that have these monopolies and is that really going to serve the public public good or like how do you structure the regulatory like the local regulatory structures around it or even the state level ones in order to ensure that like that we capture the best benefits of autonomous vehicles which i think is right. not a gift i think we have a choice to make um you know, like if you in in the in the larger planning community, there are basically two scenarios put out there. And one is is where, you know, they're safer. People who have mobility challenges, their lives are improved. It's connected. We sort of understand where people are traveling. Ideally, they're electric. So, you know, if your grid is cleaner, that's a better situation. And then the maintenance costs are lower. And and that they're shared, right? Right. But that's not the vision that a lot of the technology companies are putting out there. You know, that that vision and that scenario looks at a tripling of VMT under any circumstance. And a VMT? A vehicle miles traveled. Sorry. Okay. Oh, VMT. I, Got oh, it. I made it, what, like an hour and five minutes without using an acronym? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. That's really tough. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like, and, and, and so there's this other scenario out there and like, that's a policy choice. That's a community right. choice. And, you know, we aren't really, I don't see that conversation happening like Arizona, right? Like they're not even having that conversation at all. It's just going on the road. And then uh, lots of right. other sort of in the in-between. So 
I mean, I remain skeptical about some of that stuff. I, yeah. I there's a lot of associated public infrastructure that like technology companies like to pretend isn't important. But like we put in place a massive apparatus to facilitate car travel in like the 40s, 50s and 60s and 70s, frankly, up until the 90s when hypothetically the interstate highway system was completed. But we would have to do the same, I think, for autonomous vehicles. And given our experience with vehicles and all the things that have happened, how we've decimated trolley systems, transit systems, walking, bike, you know, to a certain degree, we've get we've gone all in on suburbanization that is sort of like a a Ponzi scheme of growth. You know, I, I would say like, why why would we do the same thing again? Like, I think we should push back on it. And mm. I, you know, if we have all this money to spend on markings, like, why don't we have it for crosswalks? Why don't we have it for sidewalks? Right. You know, protected right. uh, places. Lou says Los Angeles is a nightmare for parking. I have to plan vacations and days moving the cars around the neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, and what's crazy is that like it doesn't change your behavior in some ways because there's you know the options are a little bit. Expensive. Although I will tell you, interestingly, La Los Angeles, the city itself, is one of our densest communities, and it's but it's kind of because you mess with the numbers a little bit. So, but mm. there's there's a bus system. There's a great BRT in Los Angeles. Uh, the Orange Line um, is a dedicated bus rapid transit system. So there are places where they've tried to like change that dynamic, but but at the same time, the state DOT. And the local metropolitan, sorry, Department of Transportation. Damn, I was so close. And the Metropolitan <laughs> Planning Organization. <laughs> and the Metropolitan Planning Organization, you know, they just proposed a bunch of lane widings. And all that does. Every anytime someone tells you they're gonna add some capacity, roadway capacity, you might as well just add another 10% on to like the amount of time you drive, the amount of miles you're gonna drive. Right. Right. You sound very skeptical to me about technology, technological innovation um, being the source of our solutions. And you're really focused on what can we do on a community level, a design level, walking more. It seems like you believe that it's more if, if we if we make things more simple and design better so that people can live, work and play in the same spots, that's going to be better in the long term than simply trying to tech, trying to innovate, innovate our way out of this. Is that kind of where you're coming from? I mean, it's not that I don't think we can't innovate our way out of some of these things, but I think the private incentives are there for innovation, but then the public side of things don't get taken care of, right? Um, I myself, like when people, this is, and so this is gonna get into the political space, but like when people talk about like wanting business people to run government, that in my mind is an excuse to leave people behind. And although I think companies and private areas have the ability to segment their markets and that's part of their model and I'm fine with that, that is not what I think the public space should be about. The public space should actually be a different paradigm. And it's supposed to be a different paradigm, right? It's supposed to be around public goods in which they're hard to divide among people. And there's benefits by collaboration and all this kind of stuff. And right. so I think technology can be great and can be harnessed. Like, I sort of don't think governments should be in the technology space as much. They should, you know, it's sort of like, um, like, let the weather guys and the meteorologists interpret the data and tell you all about it, right? And then you have the US Weather Service that just puts out the maps, right? Like, so there's roles for everybody in that right. sense. And I think that that's part of it. Like, I don't know that government apps get you things. I don't know, you know, but I do think that they should be providing that data in a mechanism that that allows lots of people to take advantage of it from a private side. Right. Um, so it's not that I don't think that private companies can't do that, but I think by their very nature, they're usually profit driven, right? And profits are about efficiency and like providing a service efficiently is very important, but providing the structure so that service can be provided efficiently is also really important, but that shouldn't, I don't know that that should be t like betting on technology. Right. Um, you know, so I think that's definitely part of it. So Ben says, uh, we have a state program that if you update roads, you must have bike lanes and sidewalks. That's yeah. good, right? That's great. It certainly is. Um, ben, what state are you in? Let me, let me ben, just. Ben is in, Ben is in Indiana. I believe, uh, yeah, Ben's in Indiana. So that is a common program and that is a light year improvement over, um, what we had 10, maybe 15 years ago, right? Like that is an improvement. I don't want to make but it doesn't fill the gaps in the bike and pedestrian network. What it says is that we've identified a road problem where the traffic's an issue, safety's an issue, whatever it is, and we're gonna fix it here and we're gonna put on, we're gonna you know, add in the bike lanes and the pedestrian because we want more people to do those sorts of things. But if there's a link in the bike network that is critical to improve 
spiking commutes, spiking access, never going to happen. At a, it's not going to happen at a state level, generally speaking. Mm. I, I think that's it historically. So, uh, what about Sue's comment? They're playing with flex lanes near us, where at certain times a lane opens up for use if you have multiple people in your car. Yeah, I mean, and that can, I mean, that's an example of a policy in which, um, right, you're, you're prioritizing how many people are getting moved over it. Um, it definitely doesn't help bike and pedestrians at the end of the day, but I, it's still, I think, a valid, valid option. It's you funny, know what and, they and, did with the carpool lanes in Georgia, don't you? Do you know what's going on with that currently? Uh, I don't know if I know this one. <laughs> so they, they took the, Carpool. They used to be called car. Yeah, they used to be carpool. Car lanes. Car carpool lanes. Uh, HOV high occupancy vehicle lanes, and they changed yeah. it. So now they made them all into like if you pay a toll, so they're hot lanes. Then you get to use the fast lane. Yep. Yeah. And you're like, so you son of a bitch. <laughs> there, yeah. there's your, there's your business, there's your businessman running government. But I mean, there, there's, there's a case to be made for business people's ability to actually make money for the government, right? <laughs> I mean, can you give me an example in which they've shared the profits from that scenario? Because I can't come up with one. No, <laughs> I do not know no, where I, those I, profits. No, well, I don't. I don't know about profit sharing, but what I'm saying is, for this particular example, where they took it away from high occupancy vehicles, which was supposed to be an efficiency model, right? It was supposed to be, a, you know, getting people to carpool, and then they change it to you got to pay to play, which injects money into the government. That that was the only point I was making. I mean, that there's ways to structure that in which that works. One of them is in which you've subsidized transit, right? Like this is one of the things that the Federal Highway Administration did. They did a bunch of pilots, I want to say in the last few years, these urban partnership agreements. And basically the thing was is that they implemented hot lanes, which is what they're usually called, right? High occupancy toll lanes instead right. of the lanes. And they, but then th what they did was they took all that toll money and they ran express buses that nobody did pay the tolls on. Um. And so, like, that's a model that I think is perfectly legitimate because you can't get everybody to move downtown tomorrow, right? Like, right. like right. Build, redevelopment, all this. but, but that's prioritizing people who, you know, for a variety of reasons are taking transit. And so like, I think that's a fair trade-off. I think that's worthy of ex exploration. The flex lanes sometimes help. Sometimes they're just ways of getting more cars on the road. And so I'm less excited about those, but there are ways to certainly do it. I'm not opposed to like new roadway capacity across the board. I'm opposed to new roadway capacity as a solution to congestion. And I'm opposed to it as like, generally speaking, unless there's a reason that it changes the dynamic, it just gets filled back up again. And like the on average after a roadway widening within three years, congestion is the same, if not worse. Mm -hmm. Right. In most communities over the past 20 years, it didn't matter if your population went up, stayed steady or went down. Your congestion got worse because of road widening. Like it's because not. Of wait, wait, can you explain? Can you explain the details of that? Why, why that happened? So I'm going to flag a report that if you're interested in this topic, it is called the congestion con it's by smart growth America or transportation for America. They're, they're partnership umbrella organizations. I can't remember who actually listed it. I think it was transportation for America, but basically they analyzed, I don't know, the top hundred metropolitan regions in the country. And they did put, you know, how much your population went up, down or steady, how many lane miles and, and and then how much congestion went up and, and in every configuration. So if you built more lane miles than your population grew, your congestion went up. If you did less, your congestion went up. So basically what this tells you at the end of the day, right, is that road widening doesn't solve for congestion. It just so makes more people drive? Is that yeah. what's happening? It's called induced demand, basically. And we've uh. seen it in research, basically, like for every 10 percent increase in your lane miles you build on a new road you can expect a 10 percent increase in vmt above the natural increase in vehicle miles travel this is essentially the source of congestion in this country now there's certain roads that if you build they help fill out the network a bit more right or if you control like where there are transit lines and you've changed the capacity dynamic this may not hold true but if you're just talking like an i4 widening which just happened, right? Yep, like, yep. I don't think they're finished. Finished. <laughs> and we know it, but we still they're still it. working on it. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> but that's basically the that's what happens. So and like right. it's a pretty well documented phenomenon. So <laughs> what what do you think what do you think about Arthur's suggestion? Every driver should wear a shock collar when they do something. Uh yeah, I'll put the 
wait, the, the, the like you put on dogs when they scratch the carpet. Wow. Uh, I, what do you, 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 you think? You think that's gonna work? <laughs> they have collars you put on dogs for when they scratch the carpet. Is that a, oh my god! I, think, I, I mean, I'm aware we we have them when they bark. I don't know about the uh, scratching the carpet. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> Oh man, what do you, what do you think? Ama- what role do you think Amazon's going to play in this whole thing when it comes to like delivering uh, products with drones and like um, you know this sort of technology? I mean, right now we're not done for sure. Um, just the increase, it's going to require land, so there's going to be a lot of I would say retail, commercial flipping over into warehousing over the next few years. That's going to be accelerated in the last. 10 years, I want to say, what was this? It was in one of my reports, but it's like the freight to household tripled in like the last yeah. years. Yes, dude, Jesus Christ, no like shit. Now, it's more than freight to commercial zones. And so like we are seeing this transformation sort of play out. Um, it depends that's on what- to your point. That's back to your point about kind of induced demand as well, right? Like j- because it's available, people are going to take advantage of it. And And like, I've never had, you know, I've never had more boxes delivered to my house in my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think that transformation is done. Amazon has spent a lot of time and energy working out some of the logistics, becoming this separate provider across yeah. the country of, of, of mail. Um, <laughs> uh, Scott, uh, Scott, Katie's husband says, does your esteemed guest need a cocktail refill? And indeed she does. Yeah, I will speak um, for you. So um, I did actually just text it right now too. So we're also getting a king cake delivered that was left over at the office. So I'm going to have a king cake that's supposed to show up too, soon too for Mardi Gras. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot that's going to continue to happen. Um, you know, a lot of that is undervalued or it's been revalued, right? Like, so the costs associated with providing that kind of service are eaten up because people are willing to pay like a you know, Amazon Prime, which then now covers it. And they've managed to figure out this this model that works right. for them. Um, you know, we pay in other ways, I think, by like patterns. We give over information. You know, it's like classic statement, which is that if you are, if you're not, you know, being sold something, you are being sold. You are being sold, yeah. Product. Whatever, if, it, if, it, if it's free, you are the product. Yeah. Um, but, but that being said, I mean, there are other costs associated with that as well beyond just data, um, data loss. It's also the roads, like the amount of the amount of more people on the roads and those roads are going to have to be rebuilt. And like our HOA just popped up from like 300 bucks a quarter to 600 bucks a quarter, you know, and it's like all these things add up. And yes, you're getting uh, Amazon's it tricking pretty, uh, Amazon's yeah. tricking you into thinking everything's free, you know, but at the same time, there are associated costs that you're not realizing that you're paying on the back end uh when it comes to city costs and and road costs and all these things that all these giant trucks are destroying cheers cheers yeah this is my new orleans etched one so i have two cities uh how do we incentivize our local governments and officials to stop pay-to-play construction projects and get these communities more streamlined Oh, I mean, again, he's on cocktail too. You might be, you might be, uh, out no. of luck. No, just kidding. <laughs> that was a complex question. It is a complex question. It is. I mean, I think a lot of it depends on like what space you're in. Um, I do, I recommend getting involved in organizations. Like I feel like most cities have someone who's concerned with these issues that you can be a part of. Um, Right. Like, and it's sort of like urban, maybe livability, maybe transportation, maybe bike pad, maybe those spaces, but like starting to get involved in those, if you really have the time and the ability and the energy and all those kinds of things, which is not a given, mind you, you know, really trying to, a lot of stuff is still very relationship oriented and trust oriented in government. It is, you know, whether or not people listen to you is whether or not they have had repeat occurrences with you. Um, right. You know, I think that's part of it. And I think honestly trying to be part of the solution too. And I I don't necessarily mean being part of the political, but I think like part of the planning process, like, you know, governments are, are definitely strapped and it's difficult. And so, you know, they need community partners to be ambassadors for the things that they want to change. And so if there's a space that you can play that in, I just sort of recommend that people for a variety of reasons, sort of try and play it at a city or a regional level and not at your neighborhood level. Although that's a space that a lot of people find very successful. It's just, I think it depends on what your, if your neighborhood is already well situated in this conversation, I think that's, that's just kind of keeping the power dynamics the way they are. Um, 
But if you are in a community that's frankly underserved, then that's probably a really great mechanism by which that's you- That's such a great point. I, I, cause like our, our community is not underserved and I, and I spent time volunteering for the HOA. Um, and it was one of the most, like, it was just awful. It was just a bunch of old men looking for power to, to fight each other and, and angry. And it was just awful. And I spent so much time putting energy into this fucking HOA and I got nothing out of it. Absolutely nothing. And so your point was really interesting is that like, maybe I could have, if I was going to volunteer all these hours at a city level, it might've been much more valuable for both the city and myself. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, you know, what's funny, and this happens in infrastructure investment all the time, everybody's like, well, it's always got a multiplier. And to a certain degree, that's true, right? But like individual projects actually have dramatically different returns on investments. Like we know building greenways and like bike paths is 17 to one, but you just do some pavement restoration, it's like eight to one, but it's like half as much. And I think like public involvement can sort of be the same thing. You have, like, if you wanna get involved and you wanna feel like you have a different a space, getting involved at a city level is just kind of a more holistic one. And it's a repeat engagement a lot of the times. Mm. You know, I don't think HOAs are the way to go, but you know, you also know that I probably would have never moved into a space that had an HOA. Like, right. I, Oh, I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but I think like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean those things aren't, I mean, I can't speak for all engagements, but I do think there are things that like have a lot of value added to them. And then there's things that people ask you for your time that may not be as worthwhile. Mm. Um, you know, I think the, one of the number one things that if people are participating in is actually just enfranchisement, broadly speaking, like getting electoral reform in Florida. That was, you know, the Amendment 4 with the felon enfranchisement. But there's lots of them, you know, working with good governance groups. You can hit a lot of issues because that's one of the challenges for, I think, a lot of folks who work sort of on the more the progressive side of things is we have a lot of things and we have a lot of the things in our favor, but the political process may get in the way. And so, you know, making that process more fair and open and a little bit easier is a space that like everyone can kind of participate in. But I recognize that that is incredibly fraught right. in, this, in this world right now. So, you know, I think you have to decide, like, for instance, like Hawaii here, we actually in the last two years have switched into mostly all mail-in voting like Oregon did in the 90s. And I think like for any concerns about fraud, the best part about that system, it allows you to investigate. Yeah. Mm. Like that's the number, like if you have those concerns, which I generally don't, I mean, I don't think anyone would be surprised to find out I'm of liberal bent given our conversations and our, <laughs> but if you happen to be someone who isn't as like that, like that's one of the benefits behind the mail-in vote. Now I'm not saying like throwing it all together, mail-in voting, like poorly executed mail-in voting is probably not that, which I think happened a lot in this country because people were sort of thrown in a bind in some ways. But but as a general process improvement, it's there, you know? Um, right. Instant runoff voting also appears to be a fairly strong option. Um, you know, and so you can fight for those sorts of things that help move the needle and and, and balance the playing field in our political space. So, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm more than happy to give suggestions, like, given how I've worked in 30 some odd states, I can usually probably find you someone if you're interested in those topics. <laughs> That's I great. Or put it in the Facebook feed. But yeah, I mean, I have lots of suggestions. And I think, yeah. you know, going into communities where the capacity is not as high, like I also know you volunteer in other organizations in places just giving up your time in those spaces. You know, that I think is also helpful. Yeah, um, it's. I, I think you brought this point up earlier about how you know specifically people who are underserviced or who are not privileged um, and don't have money, uh, they have problems when it comes to having the time, energy, and you know ability to to make an impact. Um, uh, I, I think you might remember my, my passion for Andrew Yang and universal basic income, but I don't know if we talked about it that much, but, uh, Lou just brought up Andrew Yang about his UBI implication and how that could free up more time for people to, uh, to focus on their, their local communities and cities more. What, what are your thoughts on UBI? UBI starts to get a little bit outside of my space, but I think the results just your are personal political yeah. thoughts. I think the results in the Fresno pilot are really inspiring. I mean, but, you know, given that I'm a liberal and I'm probably like a lower Democrat, like lower D Democrat, like, so I kind of believe in taking care of people and community. I mean, I'm in planning, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's a good thing. I, I think it's really problematic. I mean, I think some of the biggest 
beneficiaries of our government policy have a tendency to not be those in our community that need the most support. And, and I'm not really great with that. So if UBI is a mechanism by which we can push that forward, I think that's great. Um, yeah, it boggles my mind when people are like, well, it's just going to make people lazy and sit on the sit on their ass all day and play video games. I'm like, first of all, even what Andrew Yang uh, talked about was $1,000 a month. $1,000 a month is not enough to quit your job. It's only enough to give you that little extra support so you're not freaking out about your next paycheck or your next rent, right, or yeah. your next utility bill. It's just enough to get you out of that, like – destructive, you know, running on the treadmill so that you're never able to, you know, not feel like everything's about to fall apart. Um, but that being said, even if there are people sitting on their fucking couches playing video games for getting UBI, where do you think that money's going? It's going back into the system. Yeah, it's going into video games, but that's still economic activity, right? Um, right, it's still economic yeah. activity. Or it's going for more of Kristen's pictures of her food. No. <laughs> <laughs> Of her gorgeous food. I know, I know. I'm, I su I'm such a, I'm such a, a lucky ducky. My God, the woman feeds me like a, like a lunatic. It's amazing. I would agree. So, yeah. um, anytime you want to switch. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, well, well, I can come. I can, yeah, we can do an exchange. I can come out and hang out. How, ha, ha, I can come out and hang out for a little here, while. Welcome, I'm gonna so. Hang out with Scott. You come here. That we actually great. talked about doing that, uh, ironically, with the with our friends in this group, the Borai, joking that like, oh, oh yes, like that. Let the girls all come. Maybe you guys should sign in. But um, so uh, okay, so back to the sitting on people's bots. I mean, so I think like what's really funny is that from years of different types of oh, as my hair gets all funny, um, from years of sort of different forms of public support and and having worked a few times for certain like public housing. Um, plans in the process. When you look at the demographics of people who need support, there's usually like two categories, which are sometimes overlapping. And a lot of it is caregivers, like people who either are taking care of children or taking care of parents. Oh, um, and that's why they're not working for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, and, or they have some sort of form of disability that makes a lot of those things um, difficult. And I'm not certainly going to suggest that everybody who would be in this situation for UBI would be of that dynamic. But when we talk about all these like working adults who are, you know, not participating in the process, I just, I'm sort of skeptical of that statement. I think there's a lot of reasons why um, that's not necessarily true. And I think we should have a little bit more of a blanket way of helping take care of people. Um, like we know, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no worries. I, I was just going to say, I mean, you think about like what what our main metrics are in the U.S. to to understand economic health and it's GDP. And, and that, it's crazy to me that, you know, you don't take into consideration domestic uh, domestic uh, household worker, right? A, a, a man or a woman who is a spouse, who is at home, who is not the one who's out there making the money. They're the one that's like, on. no, no, no. $175,000 yeah. a year. It would cost me to have somebody do all of the jobs Kristen does. Like it's it's insanity. Oh no, 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 not permanently. Scott got a, a he's, he I thought I was saying I was trading him forever and I was just saying to trade for a little bit. <laughs> I got still, but I got my king cake. Remember, remember, nice. last, remember last time he was on the show and you weren't and he, he got in trouble? I know. <laughs> Oh, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a serious point to be made there. Like, think about the help that families could have, and the, and their abilities that they would have if if we were if we were you know. Well, but, in, but you know, like the number one uh, against this are all those friggin' cash loan places that oh, yeah. make just insane interest on people's hardship. You know, if you knew that you had a thousand dollars coming in three more weeks, right. you could stretch it and not have to sell your soul to those demons. Right, right. No, that's that's a really you know, good point. You know, I'd be curious though, Kristen. There are places that actually like communities that have limited like what those numbers are. And I'd be curious, like where like the the amount you can charge on interest and under what circumstances. So it's not uniform across the country. I mean, I think there is a uniform number that they sort of shoot for, but. There's some variability on that. What would be really interesting is to see like what Fresno's numbers are and and see how that plays out. Or like if you could run a, I mean, this is the research nerd in me, but like you could run an experiment 
and do two separate places and one has a number on that and you do UBI and then you do it in another community that doesn't have those numbers and like right. what to those industries. Right. I can't say I'm a huge fan necessarily. Right. But like you're, I also, you're saying, you're saying, you're saying, see, do put the UBI and do an experiment, see what happens, rather than just fucking policying their asses out, legislating their asses out of the community, which you could do. You can, but like, there's a real problem with people being underbanked, and I can't believe I'm actually like taking this stance, but I think it's a fair <laughs> one. But like, part of the reason why those are so successful is because people can't necessarily have, they don't have access to banking, right? So like, they don't. Do you yeah. pay the fees at that place, which gives you a lot more flexibility, or do you pay the fees in overdraft to your bank? I mean, like, right. that's a legitimate challenge. Right. That's a, yeah, that's like, a legitimate that's comparison. Not like, it's not, in, I mean, I'm not saying any of it isn't predatory. Um, it feels that way to me, but, um, but I think there's certain, like, statements about, like, how... Like the reason they thrive is because there's a market. I don't know if UBI is going to change that entire market necessarily, but it'd be... I mean, like I said, the research nerd in me would love to like run them right. in separate cities. You know, I mean, that's the other fun one about the minimum wage, right? Like they ran that experiment, that natural experiment at Philly and New Jersey a long time ago where the minimum wage raised in New Jersey, but didn't in Philadelphia. And so they want, but like, or a city in New Jersey and a city in Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. And they watched it to figure out if it, if it affected employment and it didn't appear to at all. Right. There's, there's so many things I think that, you know, from a moral, from a moral standpoint, we want to do, but then from an economic and experimental standpoint, we don't know what the actual outcomes are. I was listening oh. to a study uh, on free economics. I know it's crazy, right? I was listening to a study on free economics recently where they were talking about felons and taking the, taking the check mark off the felon box, mm -hmm. right? So getting rid of that check mark. And the goal was to allow, you know, people who had had felonies for the, the, the employer not to know. And what happened in essence, since more minor less minorities got jobs because the employer ass they assumed that a felon was more likely to be a minority assumed so they just stopped suspicious. hiring minorities and it's like oh that's the sh that's the those are the unintended consequences we never talk about in the liberal community and it's very frustrating i mean i don't think the liberal community is exclusive to this phenomenon i think <laughs> I, I just mean for for such bright pe for the bright people we are we we tend to avoid these conversations. Well, but I think there's this element, and you know, a lot of this sort of stuff gets like bucketed under common sense, right? right. Like, I mean, like, oh, it's that's just not common, common sense. sense. That's the way the dynamic. No, that like if you put ban the box in, it will per you know like right. it's a logical right. conclusion. But it is a real problem that we don't ever go back and test like whether or not that actually happens on the ground. And right, a lot of well, reasons and for that. Sorry. Also, the timeline would be relevant too. I don't know if that study was done in immediacy. I wonder if over time that would have evened out. That's a great point as well. Like that could change over time. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent point. It actually underwrites the importance of multiple studies, actually. Like that's the thing. Like we, we have a tendency to talk about the one study like I just did, you know, but not all studies on minimum wage shows that. But that right. was sort of those first ones that had a, something that was different than the theory had sort of espoused, right? Exactly, right. Um, but I think that's actually really important. It's something that I work on a lot in terms of like how, like, and in my own experiences, you, when someone says something's common sense, I almost always can find like really good examples that disprove it because a lot of our theory is sort of based upon this rash, rational economic actor, right? Like that's, that's a very strong premise. And then to a certain degree, like we all would like to act that way. Right. When you get into behavioral economics, which I am by no means an expert on, they have all these like theory, they have all these statements about how, like why people don't act the way we think they're going to act. Right. And I think that's actually really important in policy making, which is like, we put these policies in place, in place, but we also need to then follow up and monitor like how successful they are because we, we don't necessarily do that. And it happens all the time. And then, you know, policies get continued on and, and you don't evaluate them. And that lack of dynamic feedback loop is frankly really problematic. Like I can honestly tell you that in my own experiences, like I have ha felt like I've we've had the data and we've had these things sort of structured, but then someone comes in with different data but right. their data hasn't necessarily been validated by everybody else or right. evaluated. And it, and you know, it, that's a weird space to be in, um, you know, or you're like saying like, we think this is what's going to happen, but if it's ever been tested, you don't really know. Right. And that's 
uncertainty is just not great for policy making, frankly. Right. And and because because that relies on the scientific method. And the scientific method is not often employed in politics, unfortunately. And that yeah. was our conversation. <laughs> what? About, that was our conversation about the Mars rover the other night and like humanity. And I was like, Mike, if you really, really think about it, like the the Mars thing was so easy and clear cut compared to situations where you're dealing with human beings right like <laughs> right because we were talking about like how amazing it like people because we were oh right exactly because we were talking about how people are like so anti-science now for some reason when it comes to va covid vaccines and they're so you know like dr fauci blah 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 and then but and i'm like but christian like scientists and mathematicians they can they can launch uh you know a rocket in july of 2020 and know that it's going to travel 249 million miles and slow down from 12 uh, 12 000 miles per hour to zero miles per hour at 3 38 eastern time in the afternoon how can people not believe in science and math and she's like because because rockets aren't people stupid <laughs> That's such a great statement. Like rockets are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's why the science around like social sciences is so much more difficult. It's like, and I don't do a ton of this, but like, I feel like I'm close enough to it where I talk about it. But like, you know, we're, like it's a constant search for the natural experiment. Like the situation in which you can sort of say like, oh, this has turned out like we've had some of these conditions that if you were going to do a double blind experiment, we can have it in real life. I mean, that's right. a really big challenge. So, and I think right. for public making, that's like doubly not like very unsatisfactory, uh, you know, cause you're like, we want to, I mean, people who are interested in social change don't, you know, don't necessarily feel like there's time and I don't necessarily blame them. And I don't blame right. my, I mean, I'm sort of in that same space. Right. But the problem is when it backfires on our faces and then we have egg all over our face and they're like, I'm never trusting a Democrat again. I mean, I don't think it's because we somehow went out on, on a limb on a policy, and like, I mean, there's a lot of issues. You're right. You're right. There's a there's a there's a whole lot of propaganda in the mix here. But my my point is that like you know from both sides, like let's take let let's let's take you know our personal positions out of it and just look at it on a you know just observe it from the outside. And the problem is neither side. Te uh, neither side uses the scientific method when really trying to understand what policies are the most important that are going to have the biggest impact and the most beneficial long-term impact for the most amount of people. So I'm going to be like really entertaining here. And uh, <laughs> that's what's sort of interesting about Brene Brown. <laughs> oh my God. I never in my whole life would have thought you would have brought up Brene Brown, but no, go I on. I Go on. Tell you, oh, you, are you are you getting vulnerable? Are you getting yeah, vulnerable? I've only seen like one of her clips. But if you go into like her backstory, like one of the things that she puts out there, and I'm gonna mess this up, so my apologies. <laughs> world of insurance. But like her background actually is really interesting in that instead of putting out a scientific method where we have this hypothesis and we try and test it, what they what her background is, and it's something design. I can't remember what it's called, right? But the idea is that you sort of like take the data as it stands and then you try and develop hypotheses out of that context. And I think there's something, you know, important about saying that because like science and its use of science, like there's a lot of uncertainty and it's hard to communicate that. Like we, and I think like that perspective, ironically, which is the only reason I know it is because someone showed me a Brene Brown clip and I was like, <laughs> And I went and Googled her on Wikipedia, but I think it's sort of a valuable perspective, particularly in social sciences, which sort of says, right. instead of putting out hypotheses and then trying to find data that either proves or disproves it, we look at the data and see what comes out of it. That's well, important for us to move forward. And that's probably a massive simplification. Feel free, anybody who's on here to tell me I'm wrong on right. that. No, that I think that's right. I, I think that's right. But isn't that isn't that what science has always done? Is it we, we take what we think we know? Right. We take the data we have and then make a hypothesis and then we test that data. I don't see like I don't see that as being particularly revolutionary. Well, but I think the the, the other idea is, is that a lot of and this happens like in a lot of replicability issues in science, which is that people constrain it or like there is. Um, Like they set up the hypothesis and you pick your data to meet that hypothesis. Where oh, in this case bad, that, you're talking about bad science. Got it. <laughs> yeah. um, but like asking regular people to always understand that, like when those sort of tricks are employed is very difficult. Whereas right. the, other, the other, and I, I actually think there's value in both. 
I, I, I don't want to diminish one over the other because I think it depends on the circumstances and the question and the topic, but like right. particularly in the social sciences, like we can't always get to test out our hypotheses. And you have people who create entire like careers on these hypotheses that are frankly untestable sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, like for me that like at least asking people to start with the data and what are they seeing, but recognizing that data has a tendency to be skewed and like it, it, it's an it's an interpretation process. Right. Um, you know, um, you know for and some of this is probably like just you know back from college to a certain degree, but like data is very easy to skew you know you can say like well all these people experienced this scenario when we laid it out but if everything's been kind of constrained and formulated it's an artificial environment to a certain degree well yeah mike and i were talking about the outlier the other day and how many scientists would just chop off the outlier and if you actually look yeah. at all the data it would right they're like, oh, we'll, ju we'll just take the median. We'll just take the mean. Yeah. But I'm even thinking more about like testing of like cancer drugs didn't like happen on women until like the mid 90s. Dude, you know? we, like, we, could, we could go happen. we could go real deep about science and medicine, not I fucking taking it. That's not my area. Let's go back to transportation. Okay. 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 Yeah. I'm, just, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying we could yeah. no, <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's real. It's real bad. It's real bad. But I do think um, that's part of the challenge, right? If you're in an area where you're like, we mat like the data matters and we want to do good policy making on it and we want to evaluate it, but then you also know that there's these uncertainty pieces and that there's a skepticism out there in this country. I mean, like those are real things you have to deal with in the social change space. Right. Right. Um, so we are we are approaching uh, we are approaching our time here. Unfortunately, I could literally uh, talk to you both all night. Um, I will continue talk. Kristen, and I will continue to have have, a, have an evening together. But um, unfortunately, we can't spend the entire evening with you. But I would love to know, like, you know, you've you've you know, you, you've spent so much time in this field. You you, you have, um, you know, such an extraordinary foundation and you're really fucking smart. I just want to know, like, um, as, as we wrap up here, like what? not not just what you uh expect to see but what what would you like to see um you know when it comes to n not just individual cities but like the 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 country in general and how we can improve our our overall way of life and and uh you know kind of embrace um technology but not you know but but like focus on the things that we can actually do like what's what's your vision for the next 20 what would you love to see in the next 20 years when it comes to when it comes to the united states the cities and uh america Oof. <laughs> i mean i i think the two things are is like you know one is a process transformation in governance and good government and planning where we started to see this dynamic around power sharing, to be honest. I mean, I think you see some of it, but I think it's an incomplete process. Um, building up systems that really um, support it a lot more. I think, you know, some of the benefits of the 60s and 70s was actually forcing the government to ask people what they thought. And now we need to move past that into this space of how do we co-create? Mm. and i think some places are doing it and some places aren't and it's a variety of progress and even within the same community you'll have different organizations doing it successfully versus not i think there's some real humility questions to governance and our policy making that need to sort of happen so that i think is like in process but i don't think it's a complete one so right. i hope making good progress and that we're not just in a backlash for the next 20 years <laughs> which is also possible um so that, and then from that side, and then I think from like just a larger sustainability perspective within the city planning, I think just reclaiming the public space from vehicles. Like I can't tell you how many people just don't realize. I mean, I think once you start to look at like pictures of like cars dominating our, our all of our communities, like how much space it takes up, you know, how much space our roads and the large roads take up and and why that space isn't more valuable to us for communities and our interactions and you know maybe even our humanity in that sense like that would be the one thing is because i feel like a lot of the work and a lot of the planning that happens is like you know people talk about it but like you sort of don't realize like how much we've ceded to vehicles um and i think that's a real problem and that's probably me in my advocacy space now but 
I, it, it's really kind of shocking. You know, it could be like a huge amount of money, a huge amount of lost opportunity. And we use it for just this one thing. And right. I think it's a real challenge. So, um, but I think it's also, you know, at least 50% of the conversations people will be like, but I need parking, but I need that. But I need that. I need that. It's, I mean, it's, I really would like to change that mindset so that right. when we change these things, it's not, I mean, the number one thing you want to get someone like super upset about, like the number one thing people show up for at like community meetings is you put in a, you put in a development and you tell people you're not going to provide parking. I mean, that's right. like the number one thing to get someone riled up with. <laughs> Dude, I've seen it in the HOA here in the, here in the community. Yeah, like, put in number a bet. One thing. And like, we've, but the thing is, is that we've all got to realize that there's a price for that. Like that spot doesn't come free to maintain it. It just, just right. it's not free. We are paying for it and we're paying a lot and we're right. losing a lot. And so, um, you know, again, a shout out for the high cost of parking in a seven minute video that will explain all of this to you and make you a parking aficionado the way I am. Yes, but can you share that? Can you do you, do you have that off the top of your head or should we, should, should uh, we just have high cost of parking on Vox by Donald Coop? Uh, well, he's the main person who's, uh, but it's a great video. I can share them. I don't know if I have it. Like, I mean, that's I okay. People, people can search it. What was the name of it again? Yeah. The high cost of free parking on Vox with, and it's got Donald Shoup in it. So they did a great job. It's one of the best um, explanations for why, like you should care about parking and why you shouldn't care if someone says there's going to be less parking um, in your community. So I would, uh, Lou says, I would grab a pencil and John Wick a whole room of people for a parking spot. <laughs> Yeah, you know why? Because right now you pay nothing for it. And that price, it, the, the actual economic cost of that parking spot is so much higher. Like, right. name something that you can get that costs $10,000 that you don't ever have to pay to use. Right, right. Uh, right now, the city of Barcelona is shutting down roads to cars right. to give back to pedestrians and neighbors. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I remember I, uh, there were two, ooh, two different cities. <sighs> Do you remember around Christmas that I looked up that were giving tourists like walking oh, points yes. that got them free in museums? I, wasn't it one, one was in Germany, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were like doing like like uh, city points where they give you points for walking the city and like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. C c people are taking it, it seriously, but I, I really appreciate you know what what you're saying, Katie. I mean, you almost like I don't think I ever somebody almost brought a tear to my eye saying we should use less cars, but you almost did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um i i really appreciate appreciate your time we love you and it's so great to see you and we miss you and uh thank you thank you for joining cocktails and calamity i know thank you guys it was really fun hopefully i don't get fired now <laughs> yay that's gonna make this really problematic we didn't say where you worked it's fine I, it's not that hard to find out although if if asked i could be the county manager in schenectady no right but we said katie rooney not the other word at the I know, Anvil Factory. I could also be a poet. <laughs> right. The novel. famous the famous poet who cares about uh parking and cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ba Wooney. <laughs> thank you so <laughs> thank you so much, Bathleen, for joining us. <laughs> Bye guys. It was fun. Let's uh, do it again, maybe. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Bye.